Just uh, because it's a smaller session uh, and it is going to be quite interactive, I always think these things are a bit, a bit easier if we can have some audience participation right from the start. So can I ask everybody to kind of move their way into the, the middle of the room to, to make questions a wee bit easier? I'm, I'm really getting at these people over here, I think. Everybody else is in the middle. <laughs> Anyway, thanks for uh, selecting this session. Hopefully, um, hopefully you'll find it interesting. My name's Andy Dick. I'm the Local Authority Programme Manager for Zero Waste Scotland, and I'm going to be chairing this session. Uh, we're going to talk about putting the customer first, innovation and resource collections. And the, the outline of this session is that we will profile innovative approaches to collecting, sorting, and processing secondary materials, covering both household and commercial waste, and explore changing customer expectations of a resource management service. And we've got two excellent speakers that are going to cover that to get the discussion started, and then it will be an open, open floor thereafter. The first speaker we have today is uh, Eric, Eric. I've actually got you down here as Eric Bryson. That's confusing me no end. <laughs> uh, Eric Randall from Bryson Recycling. Um, Eric is a, was awarded MBE in 2006 for services to waste management, and I know having uh, been on a platform with you before, you're a little embarrassed by that, you know? <laughs> Proud of it now, you've changed your mind, that's good. Um, board member of the Northern Ireland Waste Management Advisory Board for three years. He's a board member of the Resource Association. He's got over 22 years of experience in recycling. Eric has played a key role in pioneering new approaches to curbside recycling, and he's been a strong advocate for delivery of high quality end products that are suitable for local processing. Bryson Recycling uh, now employs over 240 members of staff at 11 depots and processes dry recyclables for, from around 60% of households in Northern Ireland using both a combination of MRF and curbside sort activities as well as reuse operations for electrical goods and household recycling centres in Conway, North Wales and Donegal. Eric. Thanks, Andrew, for the introduction. And I can say that um, I'm, I was honoured by the MBE, and my mother was particularly delighted. So, <laughs> um, you've given a bit of introduction about um, Bryson Recycling, but I couldn't possibly miss the opportunity for a bit of an advert. Um, Bryson Charitable Group is a social enterprise. Um, it has seven subsidiaries, all of which are involved in aspects of work which are which have a clear social um, or environmental or both benefit to the community. Um, it's a big organization. It employs uh, nearly 700 people in total. Uh, we're the largest of, of, the, of the subsidiaries. Um, but I, I could spend all the rest of the time talking about social enterprise model and how that's appropriate for uh, activities in the sector. But that's not what I'm here to talk about today. So that's a quick rundown of, uh, of what we do. Um, and again, a lot of activity on the local authority uh, contracts, um, particularly collecting recyclables from households and running the largest uh, regional MRF in the area. So that puts us in a good position to really understand the issues around um, exploring models that deliver best results. And I suppose if you take our social enterprise ethos into the equation, we start off by saying we want to build a business around the best model, which benefits um, Northern Ireland in terms of uh, s social, environmental, economic outcomes. We have this mantra, which is we focus on, on, on the quality of materials and what we're interested in, what is best for local jobs in the economy. The, the environmental aspects are, are really a given. Um, because we're operating in this field, we're always looking to improve the services that we provide to local authorities, um, whether it's the MRF or whether it's curbside recycling. We've always been keen to push the boundaries to find out which systems will with kind of the future in mind, um, deliver the best results. And there are barriers to both systems, and we're very aware of both. Um, we know the issues in commingled, and they are real. That quality will always be an issue, 
and the more we add materials to the mix on a single bin, the more difficult that gets. Um, and that's been exacerbated through uh, the green, green fence China, um, MRF regulations, discontent from reprocessors. And the cost of putting these things right is substantial. And we know within the context of having to drive to recycling rates of 50%, in your case, 70% by 2025, 20, that you have an uphill struggle. We've also noticed particularly that the quantity of, or the, the mix of materials in the commingled system has changed. So we're getting less paper, more cardboard, more plastic. So the complexity of actually sorting that is getting more and more tricky over time. On the curb sort front, um, the, the real issue was, well, how do you handle these same materials, the, the bulky materials, the cardboard, the plastics, um, and keep the thing cost effective? while also providing a service that customers are happy with. Some discontent around boxes, around vehicle designs, et cetera, et cetera. So we set ourselves the ambitious model of taking a step back, and let's have a look at that particular model and see how we can change it completely. And I mean completely, rede redesigning the hardware, the, the, the vehicles, and the boxes. Um, and what we wanted to come out with was a system that, that collects the highest volumes for recycling at the best possible quality. We wanted to achieve the best recycling rates in Northern Ireland, lowest possible tonnage to landfill, very high levels of public accept acceptability, something that's universally adoptable across Northern Ireland at the lowest overall cost. So, you know, a fairly modest set of ambitions to try and get on with. Um, one thing we were clear about was that we wanted it to be the best, but not necessarily the easiest, because putting things into a RCV is relatively easy, taking them to a MRF. We knew that the, the answer was going to have some complexity around it. So we start with vehicles, and I think one of the, one of the issues that we came across was that the, the vehicles on the marketplace weren't suitable anymore for the task at hand. And this generic approach, and you can perhaps see a brand name on there, and I don't mean to pick on any particular brand, but the generic approach of the curbsider was a venture that came out of Canada in about the 1970s, and fundamentally hasn't changed an awful lot. The alternative were a range of rather rickety-looking stillage-based vehicles, which generally came up through the not-for-profit sector, which also had their issues. And how do you get these bulky materials onto these vehicles and, and maintain some kind of form of semblance with productivity? And that, that's a problem. So we, we set about the task of redesigning the vehicle on the marketplace. And having had some prototypes built locally in Northern Ireland, we teamed up with uh, Roma Equip, I'm glad to say have a stall here today. And we took the, the concept and completely ran with it and have now effectively turned the curbside recycling vehicle market on its head. I think by the end of this year, they expect to have around 150 of these vehicles actually out there in operation in Northern Ireland, Wales, Scotland, and England, and uh, take the opportunity to go and have a look at how this vehicle operates, because um, there's, there's a video there which will show you in a way that's far more easy than I'm going to now try and describe very briefly. But there's only one stillage on this vehicle that can come off, and that's for food waste. This picture actually doesn't have a food waste stillage. You can either have them with or without. Um, but each of these compartments are self-ejecting. Um, the way the partnership worked between ourselves and Romaquip was that we understood the recycling requirements very, very well. They understand the engineering requirements. Um, we know how many meters cubed you're going to need for glass, for paper, for food, for cardboard, and so on. And between us, we came up with a solution. The whole top deck of the vehicle, which is fed by a scissor lift at the front, and a ram, you have, to see the, you have to see the video to make sense of this, um, is for light materials, plastics, cans, cartons. So there's about 18 cubed meters of space in the top deck for those light materials. There's compaction at the back for cardboard. The principle is that we keep the key material separate. That's paper, cardboard, glass, separate from each other. We can mix plastics, cans, and cartons because they're very easy to separate to a very high quality at the end. And the real, the real trick with this is that we can not only collect extra fringe materials like um, textiles, uh, batteries, even hand tools, which go to, in our case, to tools of solidarity. Um, we can also collect food. 
on the same pass. It's a very high, dense material, very suitable for this type of opera operation. Um, so we found that the productivity of these vehicles was fantastic. We're doing around eight, 900 houses in a day, driver plus one. We're coming back with over three tons, um, more so if we're collecting food as well. And it revolutionized, really, the, the economics of being able to run a scheme of this type. That's just what I've told you. OK, in terms of containers, in a sense, a very similar story. These containers came out of Canada again in the 1970s. And no one has ever, from what I can see, stepped back and said, well, if you're designing a container for recycling, what, what, what would you do? Um, so we teamed up with Straits um, and came up with, uh, with a wheelie box. Um, I have some leaflets here of a, a service in, in Newton Abbey, which I'm going to go on to talk about. And you, you, you're welcome to get one of these from me. Um, but the feedback we're getting from the public was, we can make these better, the boxes better that they were using. Um, but we also wanted to keep these materials separate within these boxes too. So let's put them on, put them on wheels. Let's um, put them on a trolley. Let's give a hinge lid at the top, make them stable, make them maneuverable. People like them. And that's what they look like. Um, that's the first trial we did in Casseray. So basically, we launched this combined model in, um, uh, in, in, in Northern Ireland in two places. At the same time, the Welsh Government was, was funding trials in North Wales as well. Um, Conway rolled out uh, 5,000. We rolled out 4,000 in Newton Abbey, 850 in Castlereagh. You can see that both the, the larger of those two councils are now committed to rolling them out across the borough. Um, and other councils are coming on board. So there's real traction with this model. So the idea really was we put paper in the top. The middle box is for um, cans, plastics, cartons, aerosols. There's no sorting required because those materials go straight into the top box, top deck of the vehicle. And then the bottom one's for glass and cardboard, which is the only box that really needs any substantial sorting. So effectively, what we've done is we've taken, made a kind of a hybrid of the commingled and curb sort model by taking the best aspects of both models, but retaining the essential elements of we have to have high quality material and a service which the public really, really like. A key aspect to this, and if you think in terms of what we're actually doing here, is that we're involved in a process of shifting spending resources on the collection of rubbish and sending it to landfill to the collection of recyclables and getting it back into the circular economy. So in order to do that, a natural part of that is that we're going to start reducing the costs of actually collecting rubbish. So there are many ways of doing this, which I know there's been some, some, some work in, in, in Scotland on. Um, you can reduce the wheelie bin size. You can collect three weekly. You can collect four weekly. Um, and the, the principle here is that if you give households the best possible recycling service, then they will accept a reduction in their own residual capacity, whichever way you do that. Now, some of those are easier to do than others. But it's an absolutely essential part of the economics of this approach. So this is a trial that we started in uh, February this year in Newton Abbey. 4,000 properties. They already had um, a fortnightly 240-litre wheelie bin um, collection of residual. They had two 55-litre curbside boxes. We didn't change the materials that we were collecting. We just added the new container. Um, and there was no change to their composting collection, which was in a 240 food and garden mix. The response from the public on the service overall was fantastic. And these are just some comments that were um, made to us on the, on the new wheelie box approach. Um, every household was given a, a, a postal survey. And over the 4,000, 30% actually replied. There was no prizes, no gimmicks. So we got an overwhelming response from the public. And 
hugely um, supportive of the scheme. And particularly given the fact that we were reducing the residual bin at the same time, um, the fact there was no public backlash, no negative comment. In fact, overwhelmingly people were positive about the changes that were introduced. So in terms of recycling results, we saw um, a 30% increase in the amount of recyclables collected, a 16% point increase in participation rates, and a 20% drop in residual tonnage collected. So we saw a step change of uh, a recycling rate that went from 18 to 25%. That's just dry recycling rate. Compost, we think, went up, although that wasn't specifically measured, by about three percentage points. And the combined recycling rate from the households went from 45 to 53. Now, as a first try, I think that's, those are good results. And it pushes um, that model in, in Northern Ireland substantially better than its neighboring councils. So what about costs? I'm fudging this one, because actually the answer really is it depends where you're starting from. When we have modeled it in the situation in Newton Abbey, we could see that um, there were savings to be made for the council. And simply because the, the cost savings they can make in residual collections. If they were to have gone to a three-week collection of residual, that could have been even more. Um, but we're talking about making a step change in recycling performance without an increase in cost, is what I would expect. And in some cases where we've modeled it with councils which are starting further back, the, substantial, the savings they can make are absolutely substantial. We're talking hundreds of thousands of pounds for a relatively small local authority. We also expect that the cost of the wheelie box to come down, I think, the retailing at around £37 per unit, but we expect that to come down close towards 30 over, 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 over time. Um, and if I could just re-emphasize the point, <coughs> spent more on a first-rate recycling system and less on waste collection and disposal, and communicate what you're doing to the public. And that's where I shall finish. There'll be time for questions and, uh, after both speakers, uh, so we'll move on to our second speaker, uh, Paul Rendell Barnes from Avanti. Uh, Paul's got a professional background in engineering and management, and like many of us, uh, I suspect, stumbled into plastics recycling, or stumbled into this industry, specifically plastics recycling, over 15 years ago. He's seen the industry emerge from its early fragmented position to now one which contributes growth and employment and revenue. Paul firmly believes there are significant opportunities with a resource management approach where the industry acts as a provider of raw materials and energy to the rest of the economy as part of a circular, circular economy shift. During his time at the Avanti Environmental Group, Paul has been responsible for some business acquisitions and integrations and also innovative solutions to problematical, problematical waste plastic streams. Paul. Ladies and gentlemen, I check you can all hear me. Thank you for today. Um, I'm a bit PowerPointed out, really, so I thought I'd just wing it. <laughs> Talk a little bit about Avanti. I was asked then also to put a couple of actual uh, examples in, in Scotland, of what we've done. So, a little bit about Avanti. We have 10 operational sites doing the doing, getting our hands dirty, taking resource, employing people, making things from it, making money. We are a for-profit company. We own um, three sites in the Northwest, and this is in four years we've gone from one site. We have Avanti Scotland based in Stirling, which is a plastics and cardboard recycling facility. We have John Rome tankers, which basically takes all the, uh, when you've been in the petrol station, all the dirty water, then the residual fuel, and the, the gully clippings out of that, and we've processed that. That does throughout the UK. We have Highland Waste Services up in Invergordon, which does cruise ships, uh, oil rigs, other waste, metals, high value metals. Uh, and we have an Avanti, uh, Highland Waste Services in Alness that processes cardboard 
that we bought from Saik and Natur because they wanted to get out of there. We also have a business called Rock Highlands and along with that EMAC and they take all the waste from probably 70% of the distillery industries in Scotland and we take that waste stream, the pot ale spent lees, and we put that as a nutrient bearing back to landfill. That's not something new, it is circular economy, that's been going on for 30 years. So some of these examples actually have existed. A lot of it is about changing the W word and looking at it as, okay, well, we actually do some of that already. So we are quite a large group throughout both Scotland and the UK. I was asked to look at some of the com complex commercial waste streams that we do. An example I can offer you in Scotland is a very large chemical company that I'm prevented from naming, but it's in the central belt area. And what they were doing was they had a significant amount of little bits of chemicals and solvents and waste streams that they would generate over the year and they were disposing of them and it was costing them in excess of £600,000. Working with them and the providers of their boilers, Avanti were able to step up to the challenge and we did some filtering and some cleaning of the residual chemicals and over six months we gave an alternative route for the fuel, for the chemical streams, that put that into a recovery operation and we also allowed them, with a bit of a tweak, to use their, some of their waste streams to power the gas boilers that they were doing. And that resulted in it to the bottom line saving of almost a million pounds a year, let alone the cost to landfill or waste disposal. Quite a significant amount of money. The one probably um, I'm more proud of, which is probably more visible, was certainly with the work we've done with Zero Waste Scotland. Um, when we made the acquisition up at Highland Waste, I was chatting with the plastic sector specialist up there one day, and he was talking about um, fish waste and fish feed bags and the aquaculture industry in Scotland is worth in excess of £600 million a year to Scotland. It creates revenue, generates jobs, and all that money filters back down into the economy. And one of the streams that they have, as well as the dead fish, is that they have a million, what we would naively call builder's bags, FIBC bags. These are a two metre tall big white bag. And the three main players who make the fish feeds in the central belt would distribute out to the sea locks, the fish farms, all the fish feed in these bags. And for years and years, there hadn't been anything sustainable or legal. Uh, Johnny would take a couple of bags home for his garden, and they were everywhere. It took us about 18 months, but we put a, a process in place where now all those bags from the three main players come back on reverse logistics transport, the trucks were coming back empty anyway, having delivered the fish feeds in. They come into our site in Invergordon. We prepare those bags now, put them into a format where we're able to process those bags, make them into a new product. So that piece of plastic, the polypropylene bag, now ends up as a piece of um, road furniture, or non-technically, a curbstone. That's a million bags a year. If you go on Google Maps and Google Map Highland Waste Services, you'll think it's a load of snow at the side. It's the, the fish feed bag mountain. And we process those bags. The three main clients, Scretting, Ewos and Biomar, are very, very pleased with that sustainability solution. They're not going in landfill. And again, revenue, one and a half to two million pounds a year. We've saved that from landfill. It isn't the W word. We've recovered that resource. So sometimes, one of the things I'd challenge you with, some, some of the things with this uh, recovery and the resources, we're already doing it. 
we're already able to do it. Earlier we heard talk about that the new technologies and things that are coming through and the new opportunities will drive the sector forward. And it's not something that none of us should be afraid of. We should all embrace it. I suggest that the reason you're all here today is we're all probably embracing it anyway. Okay. That's my two um, examples that I've given you on. I'd just like to reflect a little bit. Ian mentioned, he said, as the circular economy grows, we're all here, we're all available. There's a phenomenal amount of technology that's coming through that we sometimes need assistance from people to be open-minded to look at. There's some of the things, the weird and wonderful things, plastics to diesel. Well, why not? Plastic's only a piece of frozen oil anyway. There's demonstrator sites available. There's one in Ireland. There's one in the south of England now. But why shouldn't we make fuel? We've only got it once. I find it encouraging to be here today that Zero Waste Scotland and the CIWM are clearly contributing to moving the sector forward. I find it very encouraging that only recently have we been in Scotland, that we definitely see Scotland as open for business. There's no um, downside to business in Scotland. We've gone from having no sites in Scotland to six in three years and still looking to grow. But I'll temper that with one other thing. We are a for-profit company. Evidenced by all of your atten attendance here, I'm happy to take any questions afterwards. I have one other thing I'm supposed to do. I've just recently signed up to this thing called Twitter. I'm supposed to somewhere work into my speech that I found out 15 minutes ago that Zero West Scotland are running a commercial collection good practice workshop on the 6th of November in Glasgow. Couldn't really see how I was going to work it in, so I thought just being a straight talking man, you know, I'd just say it at the end. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the time. I hope I've not bored you too much. Really, it's there to echo. We're already doing some of the things. The driver is quality, and things between all of us, we will only improve and get better. Thank you. Okay, the floor is now open. Uh, I don't think we've got microphones. No, we're just. Uh, it's, but it's the same same drill as earlier on. If uh, you have a question, if you can uh, say your name and your organisation before you ask a question. So it's an open floor. Who wants to start? Good. Let's go. Okay, I'll break the ice then. Um, you mentioned a couple of times uh, about the customer experience. Uh, particularly in your presentation, uh, Eric, how, how significant, and I think uh, I, I watch with interest as the, uh, the conversation develops around TEEP uh, south of the border, um, how significant is the customer experience in the way that we design our collection systems? And as a, an add-on to that, does it matter? Um, simple answer is yes, it matters, because otherwise you're not going to recycle as much if people aren't going to be happy with the service. So I think um, y y you, have to, you have to balance a number of things together. And I think the, our, our starting point, as I gave in the presentation, was that the materials have to be right. But I suppose there's a, there's a, there are another couple of ob obvious other ones you have to say have to be right. Health and safety has to be right. Um, and the customers have to be happy with the service they're going to they have, otherwise they're simply not going to use it. I mean, even without the, it, it, I, we, we had two trials in Northern Ireland. The one I spoke about was Newton Abbey. The other one was in Castlereagh, where we didn't change, where the council didn't change the uh, frequency of residual collections. Um, and we still had a substantial increase in participation on, uh, on that scheme as well. Uh, as an, an add-on to that, for a, a, like Paul come in, is, um is there an easy way to measure it? Uh, and, and if so, are you willing to share that? What, what, mm, uh, customers' attitudes to certain collection systems? Um, well, we habitually would go around and uh, every six months interview about uh, 100 
100 customers on each of our contracts just to find out what their <coughs> views are. And actually, that led then to the innovation on that container. Um, I just ask them. OK. An easy answer. Paul, any, anything to add on that? I, I think uh, probably from the Avanti model and the Highland Way service model, we tend to see uh, customer retention. They're comfortable. Uh, we talked earlier about there being a partnership. You need that partnership approach. Um, so from our point of view, it's working with the client to develop <coughs> other opportunities through developing what we do already. Okay. <coughs> and if they want to pick up on any points uh, made there? Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, I think the relatively easy answer for that is currently a lot of our competitors don't uh, wash the plastics to take away the contamination we do. You know from the toner point of view, uh, a very small amount of a colour will contaminate the wash white waters. Uh, and certainly when you get moved to the higher end recycling of the plastics, it, isn't, it becomes not the cost of the actual processing, but the cost of disposing of that Re residual waste and if you're contaminating the wash waters significantly you first of all producing a dirty plastic out of the other end because you can't clean it quick enough so I think we have tried some tests and that I think the energy option is probably given the contamination level at the moment uh, we've seen some trials done with microwave and heating but none of those have really come to anywhere at the moment i think at the moment an energy option is probably one of the the short-term answers for it till something else pulls through absolutely mm -hmm. It's st we're, we're still seeing such a, a very tiny amount of contamination produces such a change in, in, in the wash waters as well. It's, at the moment, for us, it's definitely not something we could uh, take forwards. Question, by the way. Graham Cook from Government Commercial Director in Scottish Government. Um, I think often some of the things that policymakers don't always get right if I'm being blunt, uh, we'd done a similar kind of work and approach with RAP. And then when I was introduced with our first acquisition in Scotland into the way Scotland perceive the W word and how they were going to change it, it was very refreshing that it seemed to have come that you were already on the page we want to be and to be with the people that we, <clears throat> that we want to work with and want to grow. The strategy for Scotland is considerably different and better than in England. And certainly, from being controversial, England should take a look at the, the Scottish model and look at impl impl implementing that. Um, I know RAP has had its detractors and the way it, it, it's been funded and the way it's worked, but there's certainly now an opportunity for them to look backwards at how Scotland have taken, taken it forwards.
because eventually you're going to end up otherwise with Scotland and Wales in the right format and England being left behind. Let's not forget Northern Ireland, of course. Uh, Eric, just before we move on to another question, do you have any, uh, any alternative view to that or do you share the same view? I think we're probably in quite different markets. I mean, my, my experience of procurement is obviously around kind of local authority contracts and so on. Um, and, you know, the, there is, I think, a lot of work needs to be done in understanding how pr procurement processes actually result in what local authorities actually want. <laughs> um, and there's an art form and a science to that, I think, which really needs to be properly understood um, because it's such a powerful and um, constricted tool now because of fear around litigation that you absolutely have to get the process right from the beginning. Um, and I suppose that's around setting evaluation criteria, appropriate modelling, um, understanding that. I think one of the big issues for us in a very competitive waste industry is being playing against companies that may not play to the rules. And when that's not properly underlined and enforced through a procurement process, that becomes very dispiriting because you know you're up against companies who are going to take shortcuts, but yet there's no way of being able to let that count in your, in your exercise. Okay. With a question here. It was just a side note, and I thought I should say something. <laughs> <laughs> I can't actually see your whole head. That's why I didn't realise, by the way. <laughs> and this light's right in my. Any any more questions? We have a question here, Steve. Yeah. Eric, you, you were brave enough to raise the spectre of free wiki residual collection. I can't remember if you were brave enough to mention before, but the title of this section is putting the customer first. What problems do you think normal people might associate with that? Yeah, that's why it's it's a balance, isn't it, between these things? And um, well, I certainly know it's not whether I'm not whether I'm brave enough to mention it or not. And certainly in Northern Ireland, there's been one one council that's recently gone to a four weekly collection of resi residual, and you know, experienced a, a fair bit of kickback from the from from, from the public. Um, we think we, we think that Newton Abbey got the balance right. Um, and that shifting from a 240 to a 180 was clearly acceptable from the public. And I think if, if it's communicated correctly and explained to the public what you're doing, um, it's a better use of local resources, what the recycling results are going to be. But I think the vast majority of people, well, I think we've shown it in the case of Newton Abbey, um, accepted that to be the case. The, the study that was done, by the way, was a RAP study, um, independently carried out by Jacob, so it was a completely independent piece of work. Um, you know, how far can that be pushed? Well, there's a number of councils that are now looking at three weekly collections, and it'll be interesting to see whether they are able to um, make that happen. I'm just realizing the irony of this question coming from you after the experience of, uh, <coughs> of CIWM in, in, in London and Mr. Pickles, of course, who was uh, <laughs> um, uh, making his view very strong. And I think it's actually, it's clearly a more difficult issue to actually sell in England because of, because of that um, rather hysterical kind of um, view around fortnightly collections even. So taking it beyond fortnightly and say, well, we can do it with 140s or 180s or three weekly or four weekly. I think as an industry, we have to be mature enough to be asking these questions and to be testing it and to be honest with the results. And if the public are more mature than perhaps some people give them credit for and accept that these can be the, that, that, that there is a, a, a payback for them then I think it's perfectly legitimate to continue on exploring that. I, I do wonder, um, now clearly there are huge savings to be made by local authorities by moving to three or four weekly collections, but there may be things that need to be looked at. For instance, householders with um, children with nappies, in nappies for instance. Um, I reckon, well I think I looked at, the, looked at the figures in the census and around seven or eight percent of householders would have children in 
um, in nappy stage, in which case could there not be a separate collection to just put up for, for dealing with those to, to take that particular issue out? Because once you're collecting food weekly, um, and you then also are able to deal with nappies, there really shouldn't be a huge argument if people are prepared, be, are prepared to use the recycling services. So I think, it's, I think it's fine to push the public a little bit in this with a gentle nudge in the right direction, while also having the integrity, te integrity to say we've given you the right service. I'll maybe uh, abuse my position as chair here, Steve. That's a bit controversial as well, isn't it? I'll maybe throw this <laughs> open to uh, to the audience to see if anybody else has got a particular view on that that question, whether uh, householders are willing uh, or, or able to deal with three or four weekly collections. Start at the back. Any other points? Was that a hand here? Was that a question or was that a point? Well, I suppose it could be a point as well, because it was like the design of your inbox. How did you design that if you involve the community to get, like, to sort of buy in the recycling of the corner? I just wanted to know how you got that set up. Well, I suppose it kind of links back to an earlier point where, you know, every six months we'd go to each contract, we'd speak to 100 households, we'd ask them about the service, we'd ask them about things that they would improve. And after about seven years of consistent, we want lids with hinges, we want boxes that don't blow away, we want bigger containers, we want things on wheels that can be moved easy, you kind of get the point. So uh, it, in that sense, the public were, were thoroughly, um, were, were thoroughly uh, their views were taken on board. Um, and then it was a case of designing the, designing the product up. I mean, that took five years to get from concept into finally getting it into the marketplace mm -hmm. and now having seen the traction it's getting what i didn't say is that, that that container that model and the vehicle are both key parts of the, of the welsh government's strategy and their blueprint for recycling which kind of ties into an earlier point that was made in the previous session should there be a should there be a preferred model in scotland of course i would say yes and i think you look at the direction of the welsh who did the whole question and said if we look at this broadly, and we asked the question, what are the best economic, environmental, and social results? We do the work and the study, they came up with a solution, with a conclusion. Um, I would have thought if you do the same work, you'd probably come out with the same conclusion. Um, and I've kind of gone off your question a little bit onto a rant, but there we are. Point here, Sally. Yeah, well, they, they had exactly the same issue. They, they <coughs> removed all the 240s and replaced them with 180s and sold the plastic. Um, but yes, you do have to cost, this is a whole cost, a whole cost model over an eight, 10 year period to, to be able to depreciate off those types of, I think the issue you may have and the thing you need to really watch which is gonna be on the quality of the recyclables going through the, the, the bin and finding some way of being able to ensure that people don't start using their recycling wheelie bin 
as an alternative bin, and that's going to be the big challenge. And it'll be interesting to see when the, the MRF regulations, whatever they end up being called and how they operate in Scotland, when that will actually be measured and tested and then compared against the standard, whether, um, whether some MRFs may find that they struggle simply because of the quality of the input of material coming through. And that was, a, that was a key kind of determination in our thinking around the models. Okay, we've got time for probably two more questions. Any, any more? One right at the back here to start. Uh, well, well, because we operate both um, systems, we would regularly kind of monitor in feed material and out feed material. I must have said that the contract we have is a good contract, <coughs> um, and the local authorities on the whole generally bring us um, good quality material coming in. That doesn't stop the challenge of actually separating the perfectly legitimate materials that are in there into their separate streams. That still remains the, 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 the key challenge of any MRF, particularly given the fact that can change from load to load, from day to day, and over the years, that the different kind of complexity of the mix of material changes. So that's the that's challenge that you face with that. The quality of the curb sort material that we bring in, it's, it is of a different standard altogether. Although we're able to get our MRF to what's believed to be acceptable, the curb sort material is another level of standard altogether. And that's borne out by the way we're able to sell that in the marketplace. OK. One final question. Uh, um, relating to the, the title, um, in, in a circular economy, if we want to that fully achieved, um, surely the householder becomes an important stakeholder, but the customer who needs to be put first is the company that's going to buy the materials. Paul, do you want to come in on that one? It would be, <clears throat> be difficult for us to comment on that because we re really don't do household. household materials. It would be more from an industrial side. I think that would probably be more yours. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, who, who is your customer? Um, well, at, we have three customers. We have the, the buyers of the material. We have the local authorities and we're the householders. And they're all part of the chain. And it all has to work. Um, but yeah, from a government strategy point of view, when you look at the economic activity and added value that a reprocessor can actually turn from that waste material into a final product, it's worth multiples of what selling a ton of paper to China is, for instance. I'll give you a good example. <coughs> um, in Northern Ireland, we sell a lot of our paper to a company called Hutamaki who make egg boxes and mold fiber products. Um, and we can sell that paper at the moment for around 80, 90 pounds a ton on the open market. Um, and that's what the net value to Northern Ireland is. It's avoided, avoided disposal cost, and it's the value of that raw product as a product, as a commodity paper. When that company takes that material and turns it into an egg box, they're turning that stuff that would have been worth 100 pounds a ton on the export market to about 1,200 pounds a ton in a finished product. And economically speaking, that is added value to the market in Northern Ireland. It creates jobs in Northern Ireland, and it creates wealth in Northern Ireland worth millions of pounds, tens of millions of pounds. And it's of such a scale difference that if we focus on purely the collection part as being the valuable part of this industry, we're completely and utterly missing the point. Great. <clears throat> oh, maybe. You answered that a bit quicker than I was expecting, so I'll maybe afford myself <laughs> uh, one final question, unless anybody else can, has got a complaint about that. Um, think, thinking about waste composition, um, we've already witnessed over the last couple of years waste is actually actually changing, and this applies for, for commercial industrial waste as well. What, what advice would you give to people uh, for planning for the future 
um, what measures should they be taking to accommodate changes in waste composition to give themselves flexibility that they're not setting themselves up to fail uh, somewhere down the line? I'll start with Paul because Eric's been getting bombarded for a while now. I think my point will be to involve the people who are going to be receiving the stream in the, in, uh, and, uh, and try and design in recyclability. We have a couple of projects with uh, large automotive people who are now looking at where in the old days they would take your bumpers and other car materials and it could only ever end up as a mud flap. More and more you're seeing now that uh, they're able to do weird and wonderful things under the bonnets with the uh, engineering grades and put that back in now. Um, in the olden days, wheelie bins used to be made with a recycled content that could have been pretty much anything. Now you see the emergence of uh, people using a straight recycled wheelie bin polymer back into a wheelie bin. So it's involving the people, all the people in the chain, again, as we echoed earlier about the partnership you need all the people in the chain to make it work. And if you can consult with them as, as opposed to just assuming, there's more opportunity of succeeding than failing. Okay. I think um, in terms of capacity and planning, which is really the, 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 the question you're asking, um, I think the, clearly the biggest risk on that will be, um, and there's been a lot of talk about energy from waste in some of the earlier presentations earlier today. Um, and we know, we know the arguments about, around this, and we know the risk um, that you, you over-provide capacity for those types of facilities and then have to feed them continually. Um, and, I, and I think if you, if you look what's actually happened in terms of the amount of waste that's been, on this, uh, uh, that's been out there since sort of 2007, I remember the arguments, the arguments, I don't know, 15 years ago was that there would be a 3% compound growth of waste per year, and you had these crazy graphs that showed this incredible growth in waste. And if you had actually built facilities based on that, that assumption, and you actually look at what's happened since, I don't know, 2007, slightly before the crash, actually, there's been uh, around a 15% or thereabouts drop in waste arisings in total. I mean, that's an absolutely staggering figure. I'm saying that's from kind of municipal sources. We've certainly seen, you can plot it right back to October 2008 when Lehman's crashed. The amount of paper that comes through our system now has dropped 6% per year, year on year since 2008. And that's simply because there's been a shift across the digital media and a drop in the amount of newsprint that's actually being used. So the, the danger is, and the risk, and it is a risk, and I'm not saying that energy for waste facilities shouldn't happen by any stretch, but we have to be clear and aware of that particular risk of locking ourselves into a system which is, by all accounts, apparently less um, resource efficient, clearly, than actually turning that product back into a recycled product again. Okay. Thanks, Eric. Um, that's the end of this session. Uh, we're now going to move into the last session, so I think everybody just stays here. Uh, you can talk amongst yourself until the, the next chair turns up. Just, just to finish off, um, I think there's a couple of things that I've noted down here um, that hopefully everybody will be able to take away. Uh, the customer experience um, come through very strongly in all the presentations and all the, the questions that were asked. Uh, and I think it's something that we can never take our eye off the ball. Um, I thought it was quite interesting that we also can learn from history uh, and use that as a chance to, to innovate, and that can across quite strongly again. And also the final point that was really made there around whole system costs, and that's something that, that uh, me personally and the, the job that I do, I've been working with local authorities in Scotland the last few years, have been really pushing to... Um, to include when people are thinking, they don't just think about collection costs, they're thinking about the whole sorting and reprocessing cost and value that they can generate from that as well. So hopefully you can take something from that. And uh, as I say, um, stay, stay where you are and ho hopefully you enjoy the rest of the day. Can I just uh, ask you finally to give your uh, round of thanks again to our speakers today? Thank you.